I think we should start. I agree. I agree. There we go, Paul. Well, listen, let me, I want to thank you, first of all, so much for coming and doing this. I really appreciate this. Um, I look forward to it. You, you and all the, uh, this is my little group of darlings and dudes. And the only rule we have to be in this group is that you have to keep it all positive. Very so good. I know from the work that uh, you and I have done together and the advocates certainly that you are for child actors and that whole thing that, that we could do a whole couple hours on just some of the other sides of acting uh, that aren't so positive and fun. But what, we're, what we get to do now, I don't know why I love this movie so much. I remember seeing it when I was a kid and I think it was the first time maybe that I saw a movie and I saw a woman and it was Vavoom. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly that. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a woman. And, yes. and it was great. And you got to act with her. And of course, great Cary Grant and such a wonderful show. And um, I'm sorry, I know you so well to go on and keep introducing you. Paul started as uh, the Musketeer. Now he got a late start. You know, he didn't start till he was eight years old. He was a mouse. He was a mouseketeer, not a musketeer. A mouseketeer. Mouseketeer. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. And I think it's somebody called you a mouse once too many times, and you punched him in the stomach. Yes, the the, the casting director Lee Travers. Uh, nobody and, else called me mouse, but he did. And you were the first. Mouseketeer to be fired by Walt and himself. Right, I am the I am the world's first ex mouseketeer. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you last? Seven weeks. <laughs> That's I why was, there's not I many was, pictures. Huh? <laughs> no, not very many. I, I was there long enough to uh, actually dance uh, and perform at the opening of Disneyland back in uh, 1955 and was uh, discharged shortly after. Paul, Paul has never been one to um, stay quiet if things aren't <laughs> uh, the way things should be going. Right. I, I am not known as a shy person. But, you know, I, I was performing before the Mouseketeers, and even after I got fired, I went right on performing, and by that time, I had an agent. So there was work to be done. I got sent out on interviews. And you know that process, Darny. Darby, once you get good at that, um, you get your share of work. Now, were you having fun back then? I know it was your mom that got you to do it, but you know, were you enjoying it? Well, yeah, the challenge of you know learning dialogue very quickly and playing a part um, and, and the discipline, once I had gotten my lesson about, you know, don't screw around, kid. Um, it, it was enjoyable, and as the parts got bigger and the actors I worked with became more well-known to me, even as a young boy, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And then when I got to the Donna Reed show, that was a long-term job with a lot of consequences. Um, and you're you started at uh, 12? 12, yeah, 12. 12 to 20. Um, and uh, there's nothing wrong, as I've told you before, Darby, with being rich and famous. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, you were also certainly one of the first teenage heartthrobs with all the you and, and uh, Shelly. Shelly, Pat Ray. But, but, you know, Ricky Nelson had started that whole process of uh, teenage boys on a family show. And there was me, and then along came Johnny Crawford, and there were a bunch of us, you know, the bubblegum stars. You could all get to sing. They they tried to <laughs> they tried to get me to sing, and they just kept saying, a little further back from the mic, please. <laughs> a little further. <laughs> I have a question well, I about those teen magazines that would, oh, and this is for both of you, because I bought a lot of those, of course, in my teen years. And they always had that advertisement for the win a free, you know, dinner with so and so, and you'd send in your name. Was that really real? Did they really oh. choose a winner? Like, was, yeah, was that real? Yes, have a lunch with, uh, win a date with, all of that stuff. 
So you guys had to do all that stuff? Just your well, agent would show up with whoever and say, here's the winner of the such and such contest. Well, most of the time they were kind of cute girls. So <laughs> it was fun. Oh, so now you're telling me that's how they chose the winner. <laughs> <Just nope. kidding. laughs> kind of, yeah. I mean, the one girl that I got a date with, her name was Candy Apple. Candy Apple. <laughs> I absolutely. Sounds like one of the girls up at the mansion. <laughs> I know. I got to do the dating game and, and pick girls. That was fun. Yes, sure. I, I did. There are certain there are certainly perks that come with being a, a child star. Um, we cannot yep. deny that. That's exactly right. As I tell people, uh, I got to hang around with fast cars and faster women. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, yes. Okay, we got to keep this family friendly, Paul. Is oh, I, 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 I am. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We are. I mean. <laughs> oh, that's great. And then, of course, you started a minor consideration. Right. Which... That was far down the road. But yes, uh, in fact, part of the reason that I started a minor consideration has to do with two of the, the young people that you'll see in Houseboat, uh, Mimi Gibson and Charlie Herbert who played my uh, sister and brother, uh, because there were two very interesting kid actor stories, uh, none of which I was aware of when we actually worked together, other than the fact I, I liked them. But it was the after effects of their participation in the industry uh, that came to my attention. Yes, well, and that's, that's the thing is your your activism after you've been in the industry. And I know we, we took a big jump there and there was a big downtime there. Yes. And I yes. appreciate you. we're not going into that because we are keeping this positive. And the yes. positive thing is that the, the work you have done to help child uh, performers, not just actors, but performers, stage, uh, these kids that are getting recruited, young athletes uh, by yes. big advertising companies, uh, the laws you change, the minds you change, you've been recognized by the UN um, and help them. I, I can't thank you enough for it. And I know, Ginger, you asked if I would uh, tell the story of how I first met Paul. That's a good um, <laughs> It is a good story. You got to say it's a good story. Yes, and it's all absolutely true. Um, I was in a very down part of my life, uh, very new house. New wife, a uh, kid was just on the way or had color. Anyway, the, and there was a writer's strike, nobody working. It was not looking good. And I'll, I'll never forget, I was on Ventura Boulevard taking a left to go up Laurel Canyon, and it was raining. And I was having a talk with the guy upstairs and just going, What do you want me to do? What am I, you know, come on, it's my fit. And I said, What do you want me to, you know, do you, do you get out of the business? Do you go get a real job? Do you do? A, and while I was talking, this lady slammed into the back of my car. And I was, boom. And I was like, really? That's what you want me to do? You want me to do somebody to get money? No, I won't. And I, I continued my conversation with the man upstairs. Told her the woman came out, she knocked out the window. And she's like, are you okay? Are you okay? And I rolled his hand. I said, just go. Just leave. I'm fine. And I rolled up. Next day, and I go to, I barely slept that night. But next day, I get a call. Hi, um, I'm Paul Peterson. I don't know if you know who I am and stuff, but I think I just found some money for you if you're interested. I got to go, but if you're interested, or I think you left it on my machine. If you're interested, just let me know. Call me back. So I'm like, Okay. Who's this guy? What does he want? <laughs> what does he want from me? What's this little scam he's running? And I call him up and he's like, hi, Darby. Um, I, I found some money that they put away for you. And, you know, if you come with me downtown, we can get this all squared up because the city ha had the money, but they weren't allowed to tell you, but I found it for you. Just if you can come down to the courthouse, we'll clear this all up. I'm like, I'm still like, okay, who is this guy? Thank you very much. You know, I'll do it. Now, I knew all my money had been seized by the government years before because my mom thought that once I was off the show that, well, he's not working, why should he pay taxes? 
<laughs> but the government thought she should sell. And uh, because she didn't file anything, they just kept assuming I was making the money that I was making on Boone, uh, even though the show wasn't on the air anymore. And uh, I didn't learn it till I was 18 doing a movie. And I got called in by, by the director. And I said, you, you, you know, he said, you have to go see the producer. And I go in to see the producer. He goes, Darby, I was just visited by some G-men. I'm like, gee, man, what the heck is that? And he goes, I'm not allowed to pay you. Everything has to go straight to the government. I'm like, really? And it was the first time I found out that my mom had basically really messed up. And statute of limitations, everything, and they just had taken and wiped out everything that I possibly had. So as far as I was concerned, there was no money. But now Paul says, come on down to the courthouse. We'll talk about it. I go down to the courthouse. I go to the judge's chambers. I come and there's a bailiff in there. There's nobody else in the courthouse. Says, Excuse me, I'm supposed to, oh, oh, Mr. Hinton, come with me. We go around the back into the judge's chambers, which now is very cool because you always wonder what the judge's chambers are. We talk, he's kind of a fan and we talk and Paul and we, uh, it's the first time I met you in person. Yeah. Shaking hands. Yes. And, uh, he goes, yeah, well, we got the money downstairs. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's not money. It's T-bonds. We've been collecting T-bonds. And T-bonds, for those of you who don't know, are nice little stocks that kept gaining interest. They never stopped earning interest all through the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And, and uh, he goes, well, where are you parked? I said, well, I'm you know, across the street. Oh, oh, hang on a second. He calls up and gets me armed policemen. Now I'm thinking, okay, this something for real is happening here now. And sure enough, we go, we go downstairs into the vaults and we open it up and they start bringing all these beautiful T-bonds that they'd have been put away from me, thanks to the Coogan law, that nobody could touch, my mom or the government or anything, but since they were being held by the, by the city, the city wasn't allowed to reach out and say, hey, by the way, we have these for you. So if it hadn't been for Paul digging into the records, I never would have known this. And it was a, I think I'm the largest one. You found a lot of money for a lot of people. You were the biggest. I, I think I hold the record. <laughs> But what yeah. was fun, the, the government agents, here, here's an interesting point. They had taken all of Darby's money and residual income, but they didn't know about the Coogan Law. They never knew that those bonds were downtown in the L.A. County Courthouse. And uh, so they came to him free and clear. Yay! Yes. Yay. Please don't tell them. Maybe they'll come looking for him now. But anyway, <laughs> listen, like I said, this is some of the wonderful stuff that we can get into. This is why you are called the patron saint of child actors and performers uh, by IMDB. And there's so many people that love you and I got pictures and well wishes from everybody. But we do want to get on and see this movie. And yes. you know, when I did this with Bobby Carradine, we had some nice whiskey, sometimes going down memory lanes, there's different drinks. But for this one, I did a drink that I only do on special occasions like my birthday and stuff. Yeah. And that's the root beer float. Uh, <laughs> this movie takes me back to my childhood and all the things I love and the fun. And I can't wait to talk to you about it during the break. Thank you, Darby, because they were a hot mess last time. <laughs> <laughs> I know we did it outside. Technically, it was terrible, but we had fun. <laughs> all right. So let's go ahead and get started here. Go to, welcome to everybody, especially to Paul. We appreciate it. Um, Tonight, we are going to be doing something a little bit different. We're actually watching a movie, and the movie is called Houseboat. It, uh, was, its release date was November 19th, 1958. It was directed by Melville Shavel, Shavelson. Shavelson? Shavelson. Shavelson. Thank you, Paul. And was written by Melville Shavelson and Jack Rose, which we may go into some more details on the interesting story behind that. Um, one little tidbit of information, uh, two songs in this, uh, Almost in Your Arms and Bing Bang Bong, this is my Western connection, were actually written by uh, Jay Evans and Ray Livingston, for those of you who don't know who that is, they composed the theme song to Bonanza, I'm a big Bonanza fan, so yay, that's our Western <laughs> connection. Also, much of the music is uh, composed by George Dunning, who did a lot of the music for the Big Valley. 
So that's our Daniel Boone slash Western con connection. Supposedly, we tie it in somehow. I know. Well, supposedly George Dunning did one episode of Daniel Boone, but I couldn't figure out what episode that was. So that's how I'm trying to keep it connected. But we're also sure. figuring out the cinema thing might be its own entity. That's why I call it Campfire Cinema. So we could. And I'm sure we have a Boone fan out there that'll let us know exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> which you can count on it. That's where people are very handy. So we're gonna break this up a little bit differently. The first segment's gonna be 32 minutes. Then we'll come back and, and chat about the movie and tell some stories. And then the second segment's about 32 minutes and then we'll finish off the last segment with about 45 minutes. So I do know this is gonna go longer than we normally go. We're figuring 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Uh, we do know that tonight is the debate. <laughs> if you, so if you wanna cut bait nine and go watch yeah, the debate, debate you can, on. but if you wanna stay happy, then you can stay with us. <laughs> And just look at the highlights tomorrow. <laughs> That's your choice. <laughs> but anyway, so we're going to go ahead and get this started um, with the movie Housefolk. So we'll see you in about 30 minutes. I was just so, I was so uh, enraptured by the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so it must uh, bring back some, is that the first time you've seen it since when? When was the last well, time? Well, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but it brings back a lot of memories. You know, Darby will tell you that a lot of times the memories that we have when we see a film that we were in uh, is personal remembrances. You know, how hot it was in Washington, D.C., uh, how the hotel was, how nice the people were, how how amazingly beautiful and warm Sophia Loren was. And just incredible. Now, a lot of that looked like green screen, but they didn't... No, we... That was it. We were in Washington, D.C. for five months. We, we really were. It, it was uh, seven months altogether to do that film. Wow, five months. Now, so you, you'd... Um... Was it just a, a, an open call or was it something that led into this? Well, it, it, because it was such a big movie, it started out with the initial call and then they cut down uh, the number of kids that came back. And then pretty soon they started to clump uh, kids together to be brothers and sisters. And then finally on a Sunday, we were all called back to Paramount to go to Cary Grant's uh, dressing room uh, Mimi and Charlie Herbert and me, and uh, Harry Grant himself said, I like these kids, let's do it. So that's how we were hired. There you go. I love it. I'm sorry I'm blocking, you know. The, oh, the... <laughs> that's right, you're blocking the best looking gal up there. <laughs> I, I know, but, you know, we got, we got, we got, come on, look at that. Hey, we got a couple of good looking guys, but it, it was really fun. Now, Charlie Herbert, if you remember, he was the little boy in the movie, The Fly. And uh, so he had quite a career going. And, and Mimi Gibson, the little blonde girl, she was uh, really well known. She was in, um, uh, what the heck was the name of it? One of those biblical epics, Ben-Hur or something like that. So they're pretty amazing uh, uh, credits, if you will. Are they both still around? Well, Charlie isn't. Uh, he passed away after a difficult life. But Mimi's still good. Um, she's healing up from a broken foot, of all oh things. My. But uh, she was absolutely wonderful when we went off on a, a rescue mission uh, for Charlie and helped him get back upon friends for a long, long time. You know, we were together for a long time in 1957 and, and enjoyed uh, Washington, D.C. immensely. So you guys remain friends long, like long Absolutely. after the movie and stuff. That's good. Well, after yes, um, the, you know, Paramount Pictures treated us like royalty. We were given a driver and a limousine every day, and we only had to work about it one out of every three days. <laughs> so we uh, traversed all of Washington D.C. with our driver, driver whose name was Sugar, and uh, we just had the greatest time, and we were welcomed everywhere. Yeah, oh, there's nothing like when the circus comes to town. <laughs> I, I mean, you, there's no better way to see. You know, I was fortunate enough to see in the Kids Eye View of Washington with Art Linkletter, Marie oh. McCormick, Clint Howard. We wow. went to that thing in Washington where, you know, 
it just opens doors that you could never do any other way. That's right. And politicians welcome you in. Well, we got to crawl all over the Senate and the House and, and uh, even a trip into the White House. Incredible. There Did you, you get go. to meet the president? I didn't. He wasn't out. He wasn't in the office. But I got to prowl around the White House, which is pretty nice. And the president was who back then? That was Eisenhower. Yeah, I think he was he was in between uh, heart attacks, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I noticed that the place where you watched the concert was called Watergate something, yes. rather, which I'm sure it's probably not called that anymore, is it? Well, they <laughs> built a there? whole new they <laughs> built a whole new complex right across right on the Potomac, right there. Oh, that okay. used to be the the bandstand, kind of like Boston Pops on the river there. Same thing. They and then they built a hotel on that site? That's exactly right. Oh, there you go. It's a pretty, oh. a pretty amazing place. So did you guys really go to a concert or did they just do the short no, bit for the movie or did you actually watch the concert? Well, we, we were allowed to uh, film kind of in between numbers and then they'd usher us off and then put us back on. And people were very tolerant and of course remember we're there with Cary Grant. Come on, <laughs> big star, and and whatever Mr. Grant wanted to do, they did. You know, it's funny though when you walk the kids, or not you, when you they walked you in, and the kids started acting up. I started like this, cringing because, well, you know, you said it before. When you're a child actor, you're not allowed to act childish. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's like, well, let's pretend to be bad kids. But it was a grand experience, it really was. And people couldn't have been nicer. And understand, we all, each of the kids, and of course, Mr. G, we all knew what our job was, what we were trying to portray. And all of this was that setup for Sophia Loren. What a wonderful entrance, and she got to dance, and she got to have a, a flash of Italian temperament. Uh, it was wonderful, it was a good time. Yeah, I have to say when the little boy plays the harmonica for the first time, it sounds a lot like Once Upon a Time in the West. <laughs> <laughs> that eerie sound. I'm glad he was able to play along with some other more upbeat songs. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It really was. So somebody asked, Kay Atterbury asked, was that the boy from Gentle Ben? I'm assuming she means the youngest one, but that's was actually Clint Howard that played That's right. No, the, ben, this, is, so. this is the boy from uh, The Fly. And uh, 13 Steps was another pretty famous movie that he was in. Did he maybe do any it was TV? I mentioned Clint Howard because he did Kids Eye View of Washington with me. Ah, uh, there you go. So maybe that's where that name came up. Yeah, that could be. And what year was that, Darby? Yeah, I'm not one of those people that pulls the ears. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> chime in here because Darby um, doesn't remember. <laughs> I, I was still I was still doing the Boone show because when I got to meet Nixon, he said, make sure to tell Fest we watch your show every Thursday. And it was one of those, wait a minute, the, the president watches our show? I, <laughs> it, it was really one of those moments. So I was still doing the show, and Maureen was doing Brady Bunch, obviously, and Clint was doing um, General Ben. And um, um, H.P. Barnum the third. I don't know what became of H.P. Barnum, but he did yeah. commercial a lot of commercials back then. Wow. Yes, yeah, so that was fun. So when they that. when they premiered this movie, did you do the whole Grumman? Did they premiere it at Grumman Theater and the red carpet and the whole? No. Well, act, we were too young really to go to that. So I we didn't get to go. The kids didn't. But they made a pretty big deal about it and. Uh, of course, Sophia and Cary Grant were much in the news, not as a romantic item at that time, by the time they put the movie together. But it was late in 1958. And frankly, I was already working on the Donna Reed show. Uh, and I was a little busy, so I didn't go to the, uh, to the premiere. Because nowadays, they would drag the kids to the premiere. Yes, they, indeed they would. It would be a big component of the movie because this was aimed at a family audience with, with that little wink and a nod that all adults do when, uh, when kids are around. Right. Which, what I love, like you say, this was geared towards a family. Of course, Donna Reed was the ideal family. And we could have picked that to do, because that's like Daniel Boone with the values and everything. But uh, right. 
like I said, I'm glad we picked this one. I've had a lot of fun. I haven't seen it in a long time. And uh, they all look great. It, they sure do. They sure do. As I've told people, it was kind of the tail end of the big time uh, uh, tent pole pictures for Hollywood with gigantic stars above the title and uh, everything that you want to see with stars. Yeah, I noticed, uh, Wer was it Werner Klemper played the, uh, the assistant to the conductor who was, right. he yeah. was Colonel Klink, right, in Hogan's Heroes? I've right. never there seen were... him in anything but that, so it was kind of like, he looks familiar. Oh, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> now, well, char character actors were everywhere, and you'll see more later as we go on when you get introduced to Harry Gardino. Uh, as we get the uh, uh, the houseboat put on the river. It's kind of fun. Yeah, this is a good scene coming up. I think you have a, a peaker in the background. <laughs> oh, yeah, the peaker back there? That is my wife. You have a visitor. Just want to make sure that, get out of the house. The killer's in the house. No, I'm <laughs> well, she, she's got to watch the debate here coming up, so she'll be in the office. Oh. <laughs> We love her. She is wonderful. <laughs> you bet. Thank God oh, for her. the best. She can wave. Is that her hand waving to us? <laughs> <laughs> I may be. <laughs> so you All got right, a lot of greetings and you got a lot of go get them and a hello. I'll do a couple of shout outs here. We got somebody from Fort Worth. Susan from Fort Worth, Texas says hi. Stacy from San Francisco says hi, Paul and Darby. Gus from North Carolina. Brenda Mudrack from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Carla Craybaum, uh, didn't say where she was from. Uh, Linda, which I think this is Linda Crowley, I could be wrong, is excited about watching the movie. Michelle from New Orleans, great movie, and Paul was outstanding. So you got a shout out there, Paul. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Gus, go get them, Paul. Pamela Riley Pavkovich, good evening. Um, Susan Harlan, stay happy. And Stacy Schaefer says Darby that the background in the movie was about as convincing as Darby's Beach. <laughs> well, it was good. ironic though, the one where you're walking and he offers to, to get you ice cream. It does look like you oh, guys are on no, a, no, no. On a we like were, that's a fake background and it's no, like, no, we were at real? we were at the tidal pool. There's a couple of process shots that, that we'll is. see coming up, but we were actually there, like we were on the river. So they just had a dolly, they were just on tracks, and they just were lowly. That's exactly what they did, the big old Atlas crane. Wow. Yeah, could you imagine getting nobody in the background these days? I love it. Back then, oh. you <laughs> shut everything down. Yeah. Gary Grant, all the looky loos, right? <laughs> That's right. Because when he was at the Jeep, loading up the Jeep, that really looked like a process shot, too. Well, no, we, we had a, a, a scene flat to do the a uh, cosmopolitan hotel, you know, that was on a sound stage. But the driving around through town, we actually drove around quite a few streets. Did you in, really? Uh, DC. Yeah, we really did. We had a wild camera and everything. Oh my God. Because like nowadays, nobody with seatbelts, nothing. Because <laughs> it was where open. That was. I know three funny. kids thrown in the back. It's fine. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, let's see. Christine, uh, hi from Georgia. Many thanks to y'all for doing this. Definitely better than the news. LOL. The dancing was so, so, so exciting. <laughs> and there's that one. Uh, okay. Klemper was also featured in Judgment at Nuremberg. I guess that was oh, answer boy. to mine. Uh, Darby's dog want his attention. <laughs> so Darby, yeah. your little dogs. <laughs> All right, that's all we got as far as that. Keep the questions coming. Um, I forgot to announce this, but make sure you post any questions you have in the Q&A because I don't actually look at the chat. So if you want me to actually mention it, then uh, certainly bring it up in the Q&A. Um, and I guess and we're back to the, go ahead, Paul, I'm sorry. We're no, back. no, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm looking to see more of the movie. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I am too, and I gotta go refill my root beer float, so. <laughs> You want us to wait, Darby? <laughs> no, start, start, go ahead. Come on now, aren't you just gonna call your maid? <laughs> All right, this segment is also 32 minutes long, so we'll be back in about 32 minutes. Cool. That wasn't a, that much of a cliffhanger. We got questions for Paul. This was his big, his big scene. <laughs> okay, I made it, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> There's Paul tangled up with another beautiful woman. 
How cold was the water? There's a question yeah. for you. It wasn't too bad, matter of fact. Uh, the fact well, that was on a soundstage. So they just, you know, had the wave machine. Which, uh, Warner Bro who, which, which tank were you in? Uh, well, I, was, uh, I forget the stage number, but we were over at Fairmount. So one of the big ones. Oh, and they had a big wave machine and they had a whole mock-up of, of the houseboat on the stage wow. with water. <laughs> <laughs> really? So most of that was shot on the soundstage? Not most of it, just some of the important exteriors. We did exteriors in Washington and then on the stage, uh, as well as, of course, some of the interiors. And, and I'm guessing Cary Grant didn't rescue you. That must have been a stunt <laughs> double. As a matter of no, he, I, he actually did jump in, as a matter of fact. Really? That was a nice little dive, too. So, <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> so from getting on a plane to ADR and wrapping it up, how long was the shoot? It was uh, seven months altogether. Wow. Uh, it was pretty cool. So I know I left in the middle of, uh, of seventh grade and uh, came back you know, gosh, I guess it was October or something in the year, October, November, or someplace just before the holidays. And you went back to school and everybody kept learning and you didn't and they all looked at you <laughs> like you're a dummy because you don't know what's going on in the class. Well, I, you know, the, it's funny, the kids at, at that era, at least in the San Fernando ba Valley, they understood when you went away to do a movie, however long it may have been. And uh, well, and then I end a couple of past jobs, and the next uh, the next spring, uh, we started the Donna Reed show. So I um, I wasn't there very long. And then uh, you had a tutor from that all the way. No, no, no. My oh well, on the movie, we had a woman named Amelia DeFerris. She was fun. She was an immigrant teacher who loved Washington D.C. But by the time I started the Donna Reed show, we had Dr. Barclay, who was a longtime studio teacher, and she was my teacher for the next eight years. Pretty remarkable. So where was the houseboat in the river? Where was that located in Virginia? Was that in Virginia? Well, it was out on the, on the Potomac, kind of upriver uh, from the city. It was about 45 minute drive every day to get there. So it, it was, um, you know, it was, location <laughs> so did they really make you paint it or did they leave uh, that to the set <laughs> there's a lot of help. put your kids to work of course that's the whole you're not supposed to <laughs> i can tell you when from where we started that old dilapidated rundown houseboat to where we ended up which was a pretty slick looking houseboat all freshly painted and and new shutters and it looked great and we all kind of thought, you know, this isn't a bad way to live. And did they find an old one to, to start with or did they build an old one? You no, know, they, they had an old one to start with and, uh, and worked it up. Of course, we had a lot of months. So there was plenty of time. And, and, uh, and what'd they do with it after the movie was over? Did they sell it to somebody? Yeah, I have no idea. I imagine that someone in the uh, production office laid hands on it. Sure. <laughs> That's how it usually works. You know, someone in the crew gets the carpeting, someone gets the paint, someone gets the fixtures, all of that. <laughs> I almost got, when I when I did Magnum P.I. Yes. And I did the last one of the season and Ferrari had sent two new Ferraris because he did so much for the sale of Ferraris. Sure. And I was talking to the, you know, the teamsters, the guy afterwards, and they had one that he would drive around and one for the tow shots. Right. So, you know, the mirror gone and so, so they hadn't really turned over the engine on it. Oh. And I'm like, really? Well, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. And I made a deal and I was going to buy it. And I, because my sister lived in Hawaii, so I had all, everything worked out. And then the day before I closed the deal, the director found out about the deal. Oh. Oh. <laughs> he couldn't find out one day later, huh? <laughs> I know. I, I, no, so I, I know how that worked. I, it worked out for me when, at the end of the Donna Reed show. I got all the wardrobe. So I had suits and slacks and oh, shirts, wow. all sorts of stuff, which nobody else could fit in but me. 
that's what I came away with. Of course, Donna Reed got a couple of cars, uh, got a boat, you know. That's true, that car you guys were driving around and who ended up with that one, that was pretty slick. Well, it was pretty, oh, and this one in the movie? Yeah. I have no idea. It was, you know, kind of a run of the mill uh, a rental car. <laughs> Excuse me. And then, so those, you, like you said, they gave all the things to Donna Reed. Now, she was really like the first woman to carry a series, wasn't she? Well, you know, Lucille Ball was, you know, first. But as I told people over and over, of all the women in Hollywood, Donna was the, like the second most successful producer. Remember, she owned and produced the Donna Reed show along with her husband, oh, Tony Owen. So it wasn't that she was a hired actress. She was not the hired help. She was she was the boss. She was <laughs> the boss. Well, Fess was the boss too, right? Fess Par Productions. Well, and, and that that's how it works. I remember uh, I called her Miss Reed always, always, if not mom in public, uh, but Miss Reed always. And it wasn't until I was, oh, maybe five years after the show, we were at lunch at the bistro when Donna leaned across the table and said, Paul, I think it's time you start calling me Donna. <laughs> I, but that was the relationship. But not only was she a great boss, she, there was every reason for her to be a boss. My God, an Academy Award winner, smart as a whip, and she was the, the unmistakable a boss on stage one at Columbia Pictures. So since Donna Reed was one of the like producers on it, does that mean that, that all the copies of the episodes are still preserved somewhere? Or did those all end up with the studio or? Well, interesting you mentioned that. All the first five seasons are owned by Donna's children. Donna and Tony had four children at home and the Owen kids uh, owned the first five. Now, the last three years of the show, which Donna had to be talked into by Columbia Pictures and Screen Gems, are owned uh, by various estates, and that's why they don't go out on the marketplace. It would be a very complicated rights distribution and money. Uh, but Donna's children take care of the first five episodes, which are, of course, the prototypical Donna Reed shows. The, the first five seasons, you mean? But was that the only way you could guarantee? I know a lot of people seem to think that, you know, the generation of the 1950s and 60s, that you guys get residuals when we keep seeing all these shows that are running right now. And of course the deals are so much different now, but if back then she was one of the producers or Fess was one of the producers, I'm assuming that he obviously, every time they run or his sure. estate probably it's gets- It's important for everybody to remember that the history of labor negotiations is one of progress. And the deals that you were unable to get in the 30s got a little better in the 40s. They got a little better in the 50s. I, for example, had the best deal that Screen Actors Guild offered, which was residuals for the first five runs after the initial airing. So a total of six runs. It wasn't until later, almost 15 years later, that residuals in perpetuity became a feature of the basic agreement. I was actually happy to be part of that negotiations. And by perpetuity, you mean that anything, any new ways that they distribute it or whatever, you get you get money right. off of any, that as well. Any any new product uh, known or heretofore invented was the term of art. So and the it, kid, kids who work today are protected forever. And that's that seventy two was the. Cut I believe that was the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, Boone ended in 71. Thank you very much. But, uh, Naturally. <laughs> I know. We, we and, often miss. And it might be per perpetuity, but it might be three cents. That is correct. Cents. <laughs> I get some of the funniest looking checks. I'm sure you do too. But I'm, I know I, I once said, had quite a meaningful conversation with Spanky McFarland from our gang. And uh, I was commiserating, I thought, with him saying how much it hurt me that he did not get to share in the hundred million dollars that the art gang comedies generated. And he said, Paul, the smiles were worth it. Aww. And uh, it, it made me, 
it made me realize that for many people of that era, especially who went through the Depression and World War II, uh, it did mean a lot to them that they got to participate. So we all have the deal we, we grew up with. Um, it doesn't necessarily improve. Although I must tell you, there are some very kind and generous people in the old Hollywood, at least the one I knew, who made sure that the help was taken care of. I can remember being with the pretty famous directors who were living in a nice house in the Malibu area after 30 years of work in the industry and they'd see a young pair of kids uh, with one movie under their uh, title with a big house in Malibu. I was like, wait a second, one movie makes all the difference and that's how the world changed. So getting back to the movie, um, oh, yeah, let's since, you, <laughs> since you still chat with Mimi Gibson, what is her, what was the, you know, she got to kiss Cary Grant as well as yeah. she got to sleep with Cary Grant. Yes, <laughs> Does she indeed. laugh about that now when she, when you guys talk about it or when people well, ask her about it? Sure we do. And, and Mimi has that same wonderful sense of humor about the work they did. But remember in Mimi's case, after a lot of work, uh, she tells the story. She woke up one day when she turned 18 years old and no one had saved any money for her. And she realized she was the only person in her household who was working. And she moved out shortly after that realization and never looked back. Wow. We didn't have a court approved contracts for the movie houseboat. We were working, we were workaday actors. I had a weekly contract, so did Mimi and Charlie. It was only uh, lucky guys like me and Darby when we did a series that our contracts were court approved and money was was set aside in a mandatory way. So what would they have done if say you decide, you know, they wanted to fire you after, you know, after establishing your character, would they have just, I would have been they gone. would have extended it and just came up with the money well, it, to. It depends, I had each contract was broken into 13 week segments on a year to year basis. My initial contract for the Donna Reed show was for five years. And we had to have serious negotiations to do subsequent years. And it wasn't fun. It wasn't pleasant at all. Uh, because the truth is, uh, what you were told all the time is you're lucky to have this job. And uh, they made sure you never forgot that. Well, we need to end on a happier note. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I know. Listen, it is I was... not an unhappy note. Darby, I'm sure, will agree with me. It's not an unhappy note. It's the way it was. Yeah. I could have been drafted at age 18 and, and in Vietnam. Believe me, I was happy to be on the Donner oh, Reach. Yeah, that's true. So they would, but they would use the scare tactic to keep you in line, per se? Of course they would. You know, when you go on audition, Darby will remember these days, you walk into that outer office, there's a hundred kids sitting there. They all want the job. And they remind you there are a hundred kids out there in that outer office who want the job. Count your lucky stars if you win one. That's it, and you know they, that's your competition. That's, that's their, right. Their idea. And that's why, thanks to Paul, he, you know he's he started through the Actors Fund, looking ahead, which uh, he put me on the uh, advisory committee, and I've done that for the last 19, 20 years. But it we started a community for the kids, and you know I love it. it it's. Uh, their whole slogan is to grow, give back, and have fun. That's it. And, oh, nice. and we get a community of them together so they, because. And look like, ahead. Like you oh, say, look you ahead. Know, get off a movie and you go back to school, you can't really talk to the kids about it because it's, how do you describe the experience while well, I was on a houseboat with Sophia Loren and the <laughs> chauffeur was driving me around Washington? And, you know, so it, it's. It, and, and it's great that we started this so the kids can really just be kids and talk about it. And yeah, that's what they do. And, and not feel weird. Right. And because they shouldn't. They are part of a large community. And when you throw in the high profile successful actors and musicians that are scattered all around the world, uh, it's a large community. And with a little patience and planning and parents who learn to be careful, to plan ahead, to seek advice, 
it, you can go through it and, and make it a, a welcome experience. I wouldn't have traded my experience on the Donna Reed show for anything. It didn't matter how much I was paid or what the consequences were. The fact is, I'd rather have done it than not. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. It's not while you're doing the show. That's great. It's after that's that. right. <laughs> it's when the show ends. That's and right. also everybody that was doing everything they could to be your friend and to, you know, support you and, hey, you're the greatest. And then all of a sudden, you know, can't even get a return. Who's, who's Darby Hinton? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> it, can be, it can be tough. But, you know, the, the, the truth is with good friends and relationships within the industry, you can survive darn near anything. And a good set of parents will will insulate you from all of the negatives. It, it can be done, but you and have to be careful. And that's what you've done with the minor consideration. Yeah. You've got a bunch of us, and I should have a great picture there, a bunch of us that all uh, come together, all former child actors and stuff. That, well, that's, but what that you, they can and, talk to the kids. We've been there. We've done yeah. that. It, yeah. it, you know, we, we know what you're going through. And one of the things I love in Connected, because it's, one of my favorite things in the Bible is that Paul started it with don't judge, at least you be judged. You know, that's right. No matter what you're going through, you're going through it. Yeah, that's exactly right. It, it helped that uh, I was helped in my early 20s by Mickey Rooney himself, yeah, who man. offered advice or I don't have all of the energy that I used to have. I'm getting up there at 75 years old, and I can't run around like I used to. So it's important that Darby does his share and the kids younger than us, too. Well, and we had a question earlier when, before yes. we started that somebody had asked, was there a particular incident that motivated you to start the organization? Like, was there a certain catalyst that actually made you say, I'm, I'm doing it? here we go and, and put the organization together. I actually had a, a Sunday morning waking up to the news of Rusty Hamer's suicide. And uh, he was one of three who had killed themselves in quick succession, Tim Hovey and Trent Lehman. And I said to my wife that Sunday morning, this is never going to happen again. If there's a kid in trouble, I'm going to show up. And I'm knocking on wood as I say this. Uh, that was back in 1990, and for the last 30 years, when someone's in trouble, that's a famous kid, I or someone in a minor consideration will show up. That's what we do. Uh, who better to give the advice? Not because we're special or, or blessed by God, but we've had the experience. We have stage parents. We've signed our share of autographs. We've had careers desert us. We've had an entire industry turn its back on us. So what? There are still kids living that same experience today who need help. When? That's what we're around for. And what I love is, you know, his, his wonderful wife that was in the background waving. You know, how patient is she? She's come home with beautiful starlets sleeping on Paul's couch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell people this over and over. It does help that my wife was a show business nurse. Rana was the head of the studio first aid for decades. So when I would come home and tell her about the troubles that infants, I mean, I'm talking two month old twin babies were having on the set, she knew what I was talking about. And our first piece of legislation was called the preemie bill because Hollywood was hiring premature babies to play newborns, a pretty dangerous practice. Well, I'm all getting out, off on my side. I know, just another thing you do. Well, to no, I, it, you know, it's interesting, though, for because for many of us, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for myself, this is a world that we know nothing about. I mean, I know I was kidding and saying about the Dickie Roberts thing, but it never dawns on us as the viewers or the people that buy the teen magazines or, you know, what happened to you guys? Because you're always preserved in our minds as what we know from TV and that you live in that box to many of us. So that's for right. us to meet you and to talk to you and, you know, to see that you're people too, 
you know, so we wouldn't understand about your organization because but, we're not we're not actors. We're not child actors. But you actors, will say, understand. But, yeah. We are talking tonight about a movie in my life 63 years ago. <laughs> 63 years ago. Wow. And it is only heightened by, by the longevity of the Donna Reed show, which is not only a, a moment in time, but it captures my life from age 12 to 20. Now, just imagine if every one of your high school days was captured on film and shown to you on a regular basis. It's kind of, it's uh, crazy making sometimes. Well, but, unfortunately now, I think with the iPhone, a lot of people's lives are being <laughs> shown <laughs> up. But not Which leads to the question, yeah. that's their reality, but was what you did on the show, was that your reality? Was that like who you were yeah. or would you get off set and be a completely I think different real, kid? Or? It, it was a part of our reality. It's like reading a good book. Um, it was only part, you know, it, at home, I had a dad and a mom and two sisters and a granny and a grandpa and a circle of friends, uh, many of whom I'm still friends with. Honest to God, I am friends with my grade school chums. Uh, <laughs> I, I still see the guys that I raced cars with back in, in you know, when I was 20. Uh, it, it is, it, at the end of the day, you live with what you've done. And hopefully uh, you, you do your best to keep that in mind, that uh, someone is going to remember you 20 years from now. Oh, here, I just, let me, let me see oh, if I can get the picture. Technical oh, you here. got a picture? This was at, uh, we all got together to celebrate Paul's birthday. At, at, at the bowling alley. At the bowling alley, yes. It's always a fun group and, and um, and it's an interesting group. And it's like you said, I guess it's the same, like policemen hang out in a police bar. Exactly. You you can talk to these and, and they get it. They understand. Does that mean you have a secret handshake and a special <laughs> induction secret ceremony that nobody well, else knows? I know you, but I have to kill you if, uh, <laughs> if I throw it to you. It's, what we do have, and, and uh, this is, I'm not, you'll understand this. Everybody has secrets, and uh, kid actors uh, have more than most. Mm. Uh, Roddy McDowell used to chuckle with me all the time. He said, let me tell you, Paul, as a kid working at MGM with Mickey and Rooney, Mickey Rooney and Elizabeth Taylor, we had a lot of secrets. <laughs> and uh, he didn't have to explain that twice. So how many pe like how many child actors are in your group? Is it a, even a number, or is it just... They know well, they from, belong if they were a child actor. That's exactly what they look. There are uh, about 3,000 active kid actors right now in the theatrical unions. But our group, uh, you could, there's a core group of maybe 300 and all together, maybe a thousand altogether who have uh, made a significant contribution. But we also have the sons and daughters of famous people. And we have the sons and daughters of famous athletes. It, it's, um, it's any kid who rises to prominence. For example, there's a kid named Rick Sandman. Nobody remembers his name, but he was the kid uh, in Washington, D.C. that was accosted by the Indian activist where the press treated Rick like he was the bad guy when it was the Indian activist and, and the guys that the protesters out from the side who accosted the kids. And that's why Rick and his family were paid a lot of money by the networks. Okay, well, I guess we can go yeah. into this. We go into the last piece here. I'm trying to think yeah, if we have any other questions. Well, uh, yes. before I start talking. Do we get to, do we get to, to see something in another, uh, in another negligee or uh, something? Yeah. I think is this is where Paul right? gets his kiss, isn't it? I get to sing. Oh, spoiler alert. Sing. Oh, and you get to Sophia. sing. Oh, this is be good. This is the one. <laughs> the things you had to do, it's just I terrible. Know. And get paid I, for they it. What? Just, <laughs> they tortured me. They tortured me. <laughs> All right, on with the show. Oh, my well, goodness. We have lots it. of questions. Lots of questions. That was a good what one. A fun, fun movie. Right. I love they, they handled death, you know, they, the, the lessons in there and 
that scene in the laundry mat just made me crack. Yeah, I, um, I, I, Kathleen Freeman, what a riot. Um, it's old school. That's the way they told the stories. They assumed you understood the in-between parts. Yeah, and just explaining to kids, yeah, things change. I mean, it was, I love it. It was great. Did you understand what he was saying to you, Paul? Like, was at your age, was there, did you just say that's what my lines were and just listened? Or did you and Cary Grant have a moment that you kind of bonded in that conversation? I understood. Um, not only the conversation, but the woman dressing in the room across the hall. <laughs> Forgot about that one. <laughs> Well, see, I, I was gonna, I was gonna kind of ask because, like, Pat Blair is a beautiful woman, you know, that played Rebecca. Yes. Moon. But you know, I grew up with her as mom, so I always saw her as mom. And and it's kind of funny. I've been downloading old pictures, and every now and then facial recognition will pick up Pat for some of my mom's pictures. So, you know, it isn't now till I look back and go, oh, you know what? She was kind of hot. <laughs> <laughs> but you look at Sophia. I mean. You were that age. You knew how hot she was, right? Without question. I mean, that was that was like a a forty two inch bat right between the eyes. <laughs> yeah. So when you had the moment when she sang to you and was caressing your face and all that, how in the world did you, co you know, concentrate to do the rest of your lines? Was that like really tough? Or, and I I, I got to tell you, she she was such a wonderful gal, and and so motherly and warm and and kind to not just me but to charlie and to mimi uh and everybody uh, you couldn't you just had to adore her but she was always still beautiful with with a figure that uh would uh, stop the clock <laughs> and a beautiful face too very oh boy i'll say and I gotta say, you know, Carrie, he's kind of a handsome guy, you know? Yes, <laughs> Carrie nice Grant. Couple. You know, he and I stayed friends uh, up until his death because uh, it was on his recommendation the subsequent year that I started to work on the Donna Reed show. And Donna called Carrie and asked him, you know, how was the kid to work with? And he gave me eye marks and we stayed friends. Oh, that's great. That's yeah, great. it was. Yeah, I was going to ask because you had said a lot about how you felt about Sophia Loren, but you hadn't said much about what you thought of Cary Grant, so that's Listen, good. <laughs> I, I called him Mr. G. I called him Mr. G up until the end. I mean, we would see each other in restaurants and out on the town, and uh, he was the most charming man. Well, I love the line where you tell him he should he should quit smoking because people his yeah. age shouldn't for smoke. Older, right, for all the young people, it's fine. It's the old, Even back I, then, they I, knew. I should have listened to myself. <laughs> and uh, uh, there was a good plug for the uh, snap, crackle, pop. Yeah, so we had that too with hard boiled eggs. Absolutely true. Uh, yeah, what I love was that it was old school. Nobody had to beat you over the head. They could indicate uh, where something was going. Didn't have to show you a man and a woman wrestling around in the sheets, but all they had was a rowboat and a bell. Well, that and, bell uh, was pretty telling. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you, you you got the idea. <laughs> yeah, I think David got the idea. He was not digging that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly so. Just me. I just kept wanting to, well, I, I should talk, but I just kept wanting to do the unbutton on Carrie's, at least his pajamas. <laughs> you know, take that top button, loose it up a little. Wow. But you well, could, you know, we. Two beds, the, the husband and wife, you know, always knocked over for her husband. That was, that was the Hayes office, you know. Uh, it, uh, the space between the twin beds was lover's leap. <laughs> you know, when in during the Donna Reed show, uh, up through 1966, Donna and Carl slept in, in twin beds. Okay. And uh, when they kissed, uh, someone had to have a foot on the floor. <laughs> I, honest engine. No, I know. It just, <laughs> I don't know what difference that makes, but you know. I, well, you know, and it did, at least to be anchored. 
Loose, <laughs> loose and Desi, right? Same thing. Yeah. Same, same. Yep. The one wasn't, foot on the floor rule. Yeah. It was uh, wasn't really till what Bob Newhart and uh, what's his name, his wife. That we had a husband and wife in the same bed in one bedroom. Amazing. So I have to ask, and what was it? Where we are now? How did yeah, you prepare your? How did you prepare yourself to tell Sophia Loren that she was ugly? Oh, <laughs> you have that, to do a lot that of prep was for that. Actually, hard to do, but you know, by that time in the story, uh, we were all uh, hooked into the story because we we'd all read the last pages of the script. We knew we were heading for a wedding, but it had to be it had to be whole. It had to be you had to touch all the bases. Uh, whether it was jealousy or anger or frustration, all that stuff was was at play. It was a very deft uh, screenplay. Oh yeah, I think so. It was you know, it wasn't the happy ending. You thought, oh, the kids will all be happy. They love her. You know, no problem. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I enjoyed it. It was, um, it, what an experience. That I'm glad I had it. You little thief, you. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Typical kid. Well, I have a question. When between her gold dress and that wedding dress, is it like it is today that when Sophia Loren wears that wedding dress, every all of a sudden every woman in America wants to get married in the same dress? Like, was that popular back then? I'm pretty sure there were a lot of publicity photos taken, and it was spread all around the globe. I mean, those photographs went all around the world. Yeah, the bridesmaids' dresses were horrible. Those were. <laughs> But not the bride's. <laughs> I know, the bride looked great. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the way it was. There was only one star. And he, that's despite how beautiful Martha Iyer was. I mean, she was a beautiful blonde, make no mistake. Yes, very. What was that whole Grace Kelly era of, uh, you know, that was wonderful? Yeah, I, I agree. And it's great to see those familiar faces in comfortable parts. Um, delivering dialogue that was kind of snappy, you know, it wasn't, well, I, I thought it was really good. And in the, the movie experience in the theater was wonderful. Um, it was definitely a bag of popcorn and, and, a, and a soda. Well, and, and, you know, like you said, there, there wasn't a punch thrown, you know, there was no stuntman, no explosion, no car chase, no, the boat didn't, uh, well, no, there was, that's right, you flipped over in the boat, so there was a, uh, <laughs> that's right, that was me, typical. <laughs> it, it, it was, it was nice, uh, it was, uh, it was a very nice confection. Well, I want to thank you for a very wholesome night. Well, uh, thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you for everything that you have done for so um, many and that you ha have not only done for me personally, but for generations of young working children to come to let them not only work, because like you said, it's fun. It's not, you know, it's not the worst thing, but there are pitfalls. There are, yeah. you know things and and it's great to be able to reach out and talk either through looking ahead a minor consideration some of the things so you can kind of see where those pitfalls are and maneuver around them but you've taken it right to the courts and legally tried to get these uh things. but listen you you've got your shoulder to the wheel too and i much appreciate it uh, it is some things some things you are proud to leave behind and i'll tell you that a minor consideration and the legacy of friendships that I've made uh, with this merry band of young performers, it means the world to me. And it's been an honor to be here and revisit something so long in the past. That is just held true today and is yeah. just as wonderful to see. One last uh -oh. question to finish it out. So did you ever think they might do a reunion movie where even years later where David is the Cary Grant part, and he's grown and doesn't get along with his kids, and so feel <laughs> kind of like they did with Mary Poppins, <laughs> where you could reboot it and the two of you could still be in it. <laughs> it's a wonderful thought, but we better do it quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a lovely thought, but um, I, I think that's part of what movies leave you with if you if they touch you, is you can see on into the future. 
of the screenplay continues to be written. I know it is still a great source of joy whenever I see Sophia Loren. Uh, still alive, still beautiful. Um, makes me shake my head and smile. <laughs> now you have a reason to call her tomorrow and say, there you hey, go. <laughs> I just want to check on you. And hey, Sophia, it's going. Bonito, Watch she Houseboat called... was talking about you last night. Just want to say, you're doing. <laughs> that would be great. That would be wonderful. <laughs> well, that's your hey, screenplay. Right. <laughs> right, that's it. I, I have to write it right up. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And please give a big hug to your wife and thank her I, for sharing us, uh, sharing you with us tonight. Yes. I, appreciate I will it. do exactly that. And oh, we will get together as soon as some of this craziness uh, goes away. Exactly so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Nice to meet uh, you. Thank you, Darby. Uh, we'll, we'll talk. Thank okay. You. I'm going to, I'm going to hit this lead button right here. All right. Good night, Paul. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Darby. Are you done? Oh, good night, huh?